Jim's son, is now going to come and share with us the story of his dad's life in the eulogy. Thanks, Gordon. Thank you, Scott, and thank you all for being here. I'm indebted in bringing this eulogy to a lot of the words that Dad wrote. Uh, he wrote his memoirs. They run to, I think, 261 pages. Um, and I'm not going to quote from all of them, so you will we'll get out before dinner time. But thank you for being here. The story of Dad's life obviously begins, naturally enough, with his parents, my grandparents, William and Eustace, or Eustacey as we used in the family, Fisher. They moved from Glasgow uh, to rural, in rural Scotland during the First World War where Popper Fisher's talents as a, a, a toolsmith and a heat treating specialist were particularly valuable uh, in the shipbuilding industry. Dad was the second of four surviving children. His older sister, Christina, or Auntie Chrissy, born in 1916, Dad was next in line and due, and I use the word due, in September 1918. Uh, his younger siblings, Bill and Laura, Uncle Bill and Auntie Laura, were born one year and three years after that. We're particularly privileged. I hope Auntie Laura has got here. She was held up in the traffic. She's here. Terrific. I'm glad you got here. The traffic has been horrible today, I believe. Um, but she's with us today, and, and we're blessed in that. Our thoughts and prayers are with you. As well, our thanks for your love and care for Dad. Auntie Laura has made many trips to visit Dad uh, as he became weaker over the last year. As I said, Dad was due in September 1918, but as a result of Nana Fisher having a, a bad fall, he arrived three months early. It was probably the only time he was early. <laughs> in the days before humidity cribs too, so he had to be carried on a pillow wrapped in cotton wool for three months. And complications from that premature arrival were to stay with him for most of his 95 years. Following the war, the Fisher family moved to Australia. And that was in 1923 to escape the economic hardships of Great Britain. And they settled in Toowoomba. While their dad had surgery to correct some growth structure problems in his legs, uh, again caused by the early arrival. And in 1924, the family then moved to Ipswich. And then in 27, they moved to Wynnum as a health measure for Nana Fisher. Soon after, the family moved. You'll find there's a lot of moves in the Fisher family. They never stayed in one place for too long initially. Soon after, the family moved again, this time to Sherwood, where Dad received most of his primary education at Sherwood School, and that was during the Great Depression. He achieved success scholastically, as well as representing the school in cricket and tennis. And it was during this time that he learnt to write in that really precise script that became his trademark. And it was recognisable by all who knew him. And I think one of the big disappointments in his life was that I didn't follow in his footsteps in regard to handwriting. It was also during his time at Sherwood that the Fisher family, and Dad in particular, built lifelong friendships with the church community at the Corinda Gospel Hall. Wherever the family lived and moved, from Scotland to Australia, they sought out the fellowship of the Christian Brethren Assemblies, and Popper Fisher and Dad both made major contributions to the life and the outreach of the local church. In his memoirs, Dad mentioned some of the family names from that era, um, and a number of those families are represented here today. The Farrells, Johnsons, Wallaces, Mann, Humphreys, Schneider, Doolins, Kents, Burgesses and Britons, all old Corinda family names. In 1932, the family moved back to Ipswich and then in 37 purchased what was to become the long-standing family home at 20 Brisbane Road, East Ipswich. And it still remains in the hands of Auntie Laura's family today. So that's long term. In those years leading up to World War II, our dad finished his education at Ipswich Technical College and commenced work at McConaughey Scott Foundry and Engineering. He also commenced studies in metallurgy. But then came World War II and, as for everyone, the war, war brought many changes to the Fisher family. Uncle Bill joined the Army, Dad joined the Air Force, Auntie Laura joined the WAFs, WAFs the Women's Auxiliary Australian Air Force. After some preliminary delays, again due to Dad's health issues, he commenced his flying training. But his flying days were cut short uh, due to his contracting bronchiectasis, 
again a result of his early arrival. However, not short enough to stop him doing, I understand, some low-level aerobatics over 20 Brisbane Road and the nearby Connolly home. We're not sure how impressed Mum's parents were with, uh, with that attention, but he got away with it. Now, Dad carried his disabilities, the bronchiectasis, for the rest of his life, but he never let it prevent him from living a full and amazing 95 years. After leaving the Air Force, uh, Dad was immediately offered a position working with the US Army engineers in Cairns. His role was in procurement and supply for both the US and the Australian forces. He returned briefly to Ipswich in 1942 to marry his sweetheart, my mum, Ethel Connolly. And he took her on a first-class honeymoon train trip back to Cairns. He actually did travel first class, but that was courtesy of, the, uh, of his position as an honorary captain in the US Army. And it was a rank that was only eclipsed many years later when he was appointed honorary colonel uh, by the governor of the state of Kentucky without any knowledge of the 13 secret herbs and spices. <laughs> so with the war over, Dad and Mum returned to Ipswich and they commenced the serious business of finding work, raising a family. Jeanette came first in, uh, soon after. <laughs> and then a move to Toowoomba. I was threatened if I used the date. I was born in Toowoomba when they moved back there in 1948. Um, then it was back to Brisbane, and after a short stay at Northgate, Dad and Mum settled back in Corinda, in what was to become our family home in Rathlin Avenue, until the early 70s. The family was complete with Lorraine, born in 1953, and Sandy, specially chosen by Mum and Dad in 1962. Now, the move to Corinda marks a watershed in the story of Dad's life and achievements. From this point, I don't have to rely on his memoirs. I lived and worked with Dad through the next 60 years of his life. It was also, as I see it, uh, a time that he began to realise the threefold vocation that God had for him. Let me, be let me define those as firstly family, um, secondly business, and third, and not in any particular order, and then Christian work. Those were the three main facets of his life. I'll only touch a little on the Christian activities and the works that Dad was involved in. Ken shortly will come up and present a number of tributes from uh, a number of the organisations that um, will attest to that. Suffice to say, though, I'm sure that at times Dad struggled uh, trying to balance those many aspects of his life. He typif typified a choleric personality, if you've read the book by Florence Litauer. And he often put into practice the old saying, if you want a job done well, you do it yourself. As to family life, we were blessed in many ways because Dad had commenced his own agency business in uh, the late 40s and so he was able to dictate uh, his own work schedule. That often meant working long days and long hours, but it also meant fantastic holidays for the, for the family. I can't th think of any kids I knew who had uh, four weeks every Christmas camping at Alexandra Headlands. Uh, we had a week every May holidays, as it was then, at the Gold Coast. And in August holidays, for two or three weeks, we always went on a business trip with Dad and Mum and the family. As a result, we'd travelled throughout the eastern states, most of Queensland country. We'd been skiing in the snowies. We'd driven all the way to Darwin. And that was while we were still in primary school. I guess most kids grow up thinking that life as they experience it is normal. I'm sure we did. But in retrospect, growing up with Jim Fisher as a dad brought us into contact with some amazing people largely because of Dad's parachurch activities, if I can call it that, we got to meet people like Dr. Billy Graham. We had George Beverly Shea sing in our living room. Um, we got to meet um, Chuck Colson um, soon after he was released from prison after the Watergate affair and at the time that he was setting up the, uh, the prison fellowship work here in Australia. We had morning tea with Lady Flo Bielke peterson in her home in in Kingaroy at Bethany. It wasn't scones though, we had pikelets. I was disappointed about that. Um, and we got to chat with the governor of Queensland at a, at a garden party at Government House when Dad was awarded an MBE, an honour by the Queen. 
It has to be said, though, that Dad, for him, the important thing was to do well whatever task God had given him and to give honour to God and not take it on himself. I haven't said much about Dad's business activities yet, but that was where I was really closely involved with him. Having joined him in business after he was bedridden for three months, he had a head-on collision in a V-dub beetle, and that's never recommended. Um, he had several broken bones, including some bones in his neck, and was just unable to run the family business. So I was drafted. That was the start of an interesting 15-year partnership. Not exactly an equal partnership, as you would understand if you know Dad. He was a consummate businessman. He was an excellent salesman. And I learned a lot from him in those years. One thing I learned was that when we disagreed, as we sometimes did, he was nearly always right. In fact, I can remember on the wall of his office, there was one of those little plaques. You've probably seen one. I'm not sure that Ken didn't give it to him. But one of those ones that said, office rules. Rule number one, the boss is always right. When in doubt, rule number two, when in doubt, refer to rule number one. And we ran a fairly good business there. But again, Dad put God in control of all the activities of the business. Not just the activities, but also the profits. Dad used his business to support his family, and he did that well. But he also used it to further God's kingdom through his generosity to many Christian organisations and many individuals. He was also generous with his time. He devoted not just hours but often days and weeks to working with the organisations that God had called him into. He once estimated when we were talking about it that he'd flown to the US over 50 times for various meetings and conventions. When he retired from business in 1983, he certainly didn't put his feet up. He used the next 30 years to continue in Christian service, but at a pace that allowed Mum to travel with him on many occasions. In keeping with Dad's established pace of life, his retirement included several changes of residence from Mansfield to Mount Omni to Cinnamon Park, and finally to a proper retirement home here at Peninsula Palms. Even here, he had to put up with his share of ribbing from friends and family. We, we've never seen a more comfortable and spacious retirement home as the one Dad had. Along with his continued work with the church, and with Gideon's with Prison Fellowship, the Male Voice Choir, he found time to drive twice around Australia with Uncle Gordon and Auntie Mary, who are here today, with the little pop-top caravans. Um, he regularly, with Mum, went down to visit Greg and Sandy when they moved down to Tasmania, travelled to Great Britain, to catch up with friends and relatives there. Add to that his trips to the United States, to Africa, and many other places. His retirement in his memoirs takes up about 100 pages, and it's just full of photos of the people and the places that he loved to visit. The tragic note in Dad's retirement, and I know probably the saddest day in his life was when his darling wife, our mum, died unexpectedly after a short illness on the 24th of November 2007, just short of their 65th wedding anniversary. The good news is that after an amazing life that touched so many people, he's now with God and with mum. To say rest in peace would be, it'd be contrary to his entire life. I'm sure God has plenty for him to do still. And we look forward to finding out what that is later. Thank you. I'd like now to invite Jim's son-in-law, Ken Newton, to bring us some memories of Jim's involvement in the numerous ministries he has been associated with over the years. Thanks, Ken. Jim Fisher was a truly great man. He was also an exceptional Christian leader. And I say this from 60 years of personal experience, 
having been employed by him for three years and having been his son-in-law for 48. Jim Fisher was a Christian entrepreneur and he achieved this without ever having been employed by a Christian organisation or indulging in any formal theological studies. His modus operandi was to go about his business enterprises and still find time to spearhead Christian ventures. I will share some tributes from those linked with a number of these interdenominational ministries. Let me begin with the Gideons, probably the ministry closest to his heart. Jim Fisher was one of the original Australian members joining in 1958. He was not just a committee man, but put himself in the front line of Bible distribution. Es Morse, a very close friend, can tell memorable stories of their work together in outback Queensland. Jim became national president in 1963 and was an international trustee from 1977 to 83. He rose to be the president of Gideon's Australia and a delegate to the international board, which later appointed him as international chaplain. Ken Speakman, a past US director of the international division of Gideon's, writes this. Reba and I have just read with tearful eyes the news that our beloved friend has gone to glory. He is resting in the presence of our loving father whom he loved and served so faithfully. All of my children knew and loved your father. I told Jim in one of my last emails to him that we have a special guest quarters in our home called the Jim Fisher Suite. We will now rename it the Jim Fisher Memorial Suite. We are so thankful to our loving God who allowed Jim to reach the age of 95. Only eternity reveal, will reveal the results of Brother Jim's faithful service over the many years of his life. My life has been greatly enriched because I was privileged to know your father. Betty Taylor from the Gideon's Auxiliary in the US writes, my heart is sad and yet rejoicing. No better place to be than with our Lord. I remember Jim's sharing devotions many times whilst I was on staff. Such a godly, fun-loving Gideon. Many trips he made to headquarters while serving on the cabinet in different capacities. He was never too busy in his visits to stop by the receptionist's desk. He had a very special way of making you feel he cared about you as a friend and a friend he was. Kevin uh, Fuller, who's a member of the Australian Cabinet, wrote, I am currently in Madagascar and have heard about the passing of your beloved father into the presence of the Lord. Please pass on my apology at not being able to be present for the service. I have been privileged to share the honour with your dad of being one of the two Australian Gideons elected as officers of the Gideons International. Jim Fisher was the father of the Gideon ministry in Australia in every sense of the word. He was respected by everyone in the ministry in Australia and internationally. It was always a highlight at the international convention when Jim could be in attendance. He was treated like a celebrity. It was a great demonstration of the love and respect which he had for others and which others had for him. Bill McClintock writes, we have much to thank God for the privilege and honour it has been to know Jim for more than 30 wonderful years and the wonderful times we shared together. We all have much to thank God for as Jim touched so many thousands of lives. As we write this, we are about to leave Longreach for Windora as we are currently on the 2014 Western Safari. Jim loved Gideon safaris and always, until this year, chose the scripture text for the safari. On Sunday, we will have a special communion service on the banks of the Wilson River at Nokhandra, and we will include our own memorial tribute to him. Our thoughts will be with you on Monday, even though we are so far away. Stephen Strachan, Queensland Chaplain of Gideon's, writes this. 
Please allow me to extend the sympathy of the Queensland Gideon Ministry to you today. We are also full of joy for having had Jim Fisher with us for so many years and through so many wonderful experiences. He was truly loved by us and we rejoice at what his life has meant to Gideons in Queensland and to the Kingdom of God. And lastly, from the Gideons, from Lincoln Hawkins, who's the um, National Executive Director here. Jim's participation in the ministry over more than 55 years was truly remarkable. Jim played a crucial role in the establishment of the ministry in Australia in the early days and established a sure foundation on which others were able to build. Jim continuously served on a national council for 21 years. He was the first non-American to serve on the international cabinet when he became international chaplain, a position he held for three years. Jim Fisher was well known and loved here in Australia and in the US. He was a mentor of many, great encourager and avid in his proclamation of the truth of the gospel. But we turn now more briefly to some other ministry interests. Whilst Jim would not have regarded himself as an evangelist, supporting evangelistic efforts was one of his passions. In 1959, he was appointed as vice chairman of the Billy Graham Crusade in Brisbane at a time when normally only ordained clergy would be given that position. This role began a deep personal relationship with Billy Graham and others on the team. And as Gordon has mentioned, few can claim, can claim to have had George Beverly Shea, Cliff Barrows and Ted Smith around their home piano enjoying a night of music. The links with Billy Graham um, were such that the pair exchanged Christmas greetings ever since that Brisbane crusade in 1959. These links with this evangelistic team were strengthened when Jim became heavily involved in the subsequent Leighton Ford crusades. Remember Leighton was Billy Graham's son-in-law and when he was able to catch up with Franklin Graham, Billy's son, when he visited Australia recently. Jim's concern for evangelism also brought him in contract with an outreach to reach Christian businessmen. He was for a number of years a member of their organising committee and he personally hosted lunches at the Canberra Hotel where he had at that time an office. Jim Fisher also had a musical talent. He was for many years an integral part of Sacred Half Hour, a half hourly program of music and message which were broadcast across Brisbane radio and later into several country areas. He contributed to the program as guest speaker, choir member and soloist. His interest in broadcasting the gospel no doubt fueled his involvement in family radio as he was one of the early directors of, of this organisation. In the 1950s, he was instrumental in the formation of a gospel quartet consisting of four men from the Corinda Assembly which sang at gospel outreaches and other events. When a choir of male voices, inspired by a program in Scotland, was commenced in Sydney, Jim, through his links with Bruce Stephen, the um, choir master there, set about to develop such a program in Brisbane. This choir, with its Brisbane origin in 1954, continues to this day, and we've appreciated their contribution already this evening. Malcolm Arnold, the current chairman, wrote, Jim, as he was affectionately known, was a founding member of the Brisbane Festival My Voice Choir in 1954 and remained an active member until the early 90s when failing health prevented his further attendance. His presence and contribution was a great contribution to all in the choir. He was the publicity officer of the first festival held in the City Hall in November 1955. He served on the committee for many years and was chairman for more than a decade and on occasions compared a number of Brisbane and regional festivals. He was honoured with life membership in 2009 in recognition of his extraordinary, distinguished and meritorious service to God through the ministry of the choir. Jim was an esteemed brother in Christ and the choir honours his memory and counts it a privilege to participate 
in this memorial service today. Jim's concern for young people fostered his interest in the Every Boys and Every Girls rally organisation, which he heard about from Neville Backpool following a visit to New Zealand. He set about to establish such a, an organisation among Brisbane Assemblies, Corinda Assembly leading the charge. In 1980, at a President's Breakfast in Washington, D.C., Jim met Chuck Colson and thus began his association with Prison Fellowship and the subsequent establishment of that organisation in Australia. Jim was appointed to the International Board of Prison Fellowship, which took him to a number of countries. Nola Elvery, a missionary linked with Australian Missionary Tidings, reminded us recently of the time she met with him at Nairobi at the time of international meetings of that organisation. Jim had a close relationship with Chuck Holson and on one occasion played golf with him here in Brisbane. I know this because Chuck borrowed my shoes for the event. However, I did not rate an invitation to the outing, just my shoes. Ron Nickel of the Prison Fellowship International Board writes, it was my pleasure to have known him for more than 30 years. He was one of the founding leaders in the Prison Fellowship International Movement, even as he was a driving force in the development of Prison Fellowship in Queensland and in Australia. It was upon his meeting with Chuck Colson during one of his visits to America that Jim invited him to Australia for various speaking engagements, as well as for the premiere of the motion picture Born Again. Through Jim's initiative and vision, Prison Fellowship took root in Australia and became one of the five founding ministries of Prison Fellowship internationally. For more than 10 years, Jim served as a member of the Prison Fellowship International Board and is well remembered for his sound advice and his deep conviction that the ministry be established on a sound biblical foundation. His prayers resonated with a deep love for the Father and a passion for salvation of not only sinners, but all people imprisoned in sin. Jim left an indelible imprint on Prison Fellowship International as an organisation and on those who were privileged to work alongside him during those formative years. What he advocated internationally, he put into practice locally through the Ministry of Prison Fellowship in Queensland. He was one of our board members who practiced what he preached. And thus, when Jim spoke, people listened. Another international figure across Jim's path was John Haggai. John's ministry was to promote leadership development in both Western and non-Western countries. Jim initially provided office space for this organization. The chairman of Haggai Institute Australia wrote, Jim Fisher was the first chairman of the Australian Board of Directors of Haggai Ministries Australia and served with innovation and inspiration in the initial years of its establishment, also having participated in the crusades of Dr Haggai led in the early 70s and 80s. And he continued to support this ministry throughout the years. Jim met up with John Haggai recently when he was in Australia for annual meetings. And John Haggai sent a very brief message saying, what a personal debt I owe this man. He enriched my life. But it's time to bring this segment to a close. We have failed to take account of the huge contribution Jim Fisher made to the lives of his extended families, both biological and spiritual, and to Christian workers located in Australia and overseas. A trust fund he established many years ago has been used to contribute significantly to the financial needs of many. Others have profited from his wise counsel and fervent prayer life. And yet, if my father-in-law were able to stand up here now and say something at the conclusion of all of this, I believe he would sum it up in just 10 words, which would be, to God be the glory, great things he hath done. But before I um, take my seat, 
I've been asked just to mention a promotion of Gideon Ministries, which you might like to contribute to in, recognize, in recognition of Jim Fisher's life. As part of this Thanksgiving service, all those who love Jim will have the opportunity to provide for his witness to continue by making a special offering to the Gideons, a ministry that was so close to his heart, to provide Bibles for a needy world in remembrance of him. The family would be delighted if you would care to mark the memory of, our, of their much-loved father and grandfather in this way. Cards and in-memory offering envelopes have been provided as you arrive this afternoon. Envelopes may be completed and received at the door or mailed. Every dollar in the memorial offering will go directly to scriptures which will be distributed somewhere in the 197 countries in which the Gideons operate. This would be a fitting tribute to him and a great reminder of this occasion today. Honouring Jim Fisher and my father-in-law in this way will indeed keep his witness alive in a way that he would love.